So let me, uh, well, let me welcome you again to the second day of this, uh, of this meeting. Uh, and let me just very briefly uh, introduce uh, you to Hyun, uh, give him a welcome. Um, Hyun is an advisor and head of research at the BIS. And I was, uh, I had the opportunity to work with him uh, in the G20 and at the BIS when I was at the Banco de Mexico. And it is, I believe that he is uh, uh, one of the really top uh, macroeconomists and financial economists that there, there are. His insights into the topics that he researches are uh, basically uh, one of a kind. And we're very, very honored. And it's a pleasure for me to have him uh, here today in this meeting uh, that he accepted to participate with us. So uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to briefly introduce him. But now I, I give the floor. Welcome, Hyun. Uh, now I welcome, uh, I give the floor to Serafim so that he can properly introduce you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Hyun. Serafim, por favor. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Shin. Uh, it's it's the hard task for me to introduce uh, me uh, for me a person that everybody knows very well. So well, I, I do my best. So some date about uh, Professor Shin. So Dr. Hyunson Shin took up the position of economic advisor and head of research at the BIS on May the first, uh, 2014. Before joining the BIS, Dr. Shin was the huge Rogers professor of economics at Princeton University. In 2010, uh, on leave from Princeton, he served as a senior advisor to the Korean president, taking a leading role in formulating financial stability policy in Korea and developing the agenda for the G20 during Korea's presidency. From 2000 to 2005, he was professor of finance at the London School of Economics. And I, I think that would be the time when you met our good friend and colleague, uh, Dimitri Somokos. He told me that he knows you very well. So, also, in addition to his academic position, uh, Shin served as an advisor to the Bank of England from 2000 to 2005, and he's a member of the Financial Advisory Roundtable at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of New York and a panel member of the U.S. Monetary Policy Forum since 2007. He's a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research since 1998. Shin was the chairman of the editorial board of the Review of Economic Studies from 1999 to 2003, he holds a doctor in philosophy and a master in philosophy in economics from Oxford University, Northfield College, and a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics from the same university. Dr. Shin's uh, fields of interest are macroeconomics, finance, and international economics. So I will not stop the rest of the audience enjoying uh, you talking. So please, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Seraphim, um, and thank you, Manuel, for that uh, very generous introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to join you in this, um, in this very uh, excellent forum. Um, I was in Cartagena uh, a couple of years ago when you had the, the physical meeting, and uh, um, uh, I regard this meeting as being really the highlight of the year. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides. If you just give me a, a second. So I hope you can see that. Um, so what I would like to do uh, today is to cover, um, I think, a, a quite a topical issue, which is the role of uh, central banks in the, um, uh, in the innovation area uh, at a time when uh, CBDCs, big techs, uh, and other um, uh, issues to do with uh, digitalization and innovation are really at the center of the, of, of the central banks' uh, debates. And uh, um, if you think about uh, some of the issues that we have on the table, um, they are all issues that uh, lie at the heart of the central bank's uh, mission. Uh, and so for this reason, um, uh, we at the BIS think that, uh, you know, we have uh, really a duty to be uh, not only following the debate, but uh, also to be um, at the forefront or indeed, uh, you know, uh, even um, ahead of the curve. Um, so the particular topic that I would like to address is um, uh, the role of big techs um, in uh, financial intermediation, and in particular, it's uh, their role in the payment system. Now, if we look at the sources uh, of revenue by sector uh, of, the, of the big techs, 
Uh, financial services is still a relatively small proportion. So this is a pie chart that uh, we reported in our um, annual economic report special chapter two years ago. And it's that uh, segment in light blue, uh, only 11.3% of the revenues of the big techs uh, derive from financial services. Um, so it's a relatively small part of their activities in that respect. But um, we uh, have been discussing uh, the issues surrounding big tech's activity in financial services because of the potential uh, that uh, they can rapidly increase their footprint um, in financial services. And uh, one of the mechanisms and one of the background uh, mechanisms that uh, we think is very important, and this is again something that we uh, discuss at length in that special chapter, is the, is the um, so-called uh, data network activities loop or the DNA loop. And the idea is that uh, big tech's business models, whether it be in e-commerce or in social media or in search, uh, rely on the direct interaction of, uh, of many of the users, um, which, uh, uh, which generate the data, which in turn uh, strengthen the network effects that, um, uh, that are more attractive to the users themselves. So the data lead to uh, greater network effects, which lead to greater activities, which in turn generate the more, um, you know, generate the data that uh, was the beginning of the cycle. So we are uh, full cycle. And this is a kind of a, a virtuous circle that uh, strengthens their position. Now, one of the uh, issues that have come up is that uh, if um, given the, uh, the nature of the business model and uh, this DNA loop, there is a potential uh, that the big techs could be so successful uh, that they uh, could erect silos or indeed the walled gardens, um, which uh, end up by excluding potential competitors and having users more or less uh, be fully contained uh, within uh, you know, their network. And um, uh, in the short term, of course, this is uh, the, the virtuous circle is going to be uh, very beneficial for financial inclusion and, and, uh, and financial inclusion, I think, is going to be one of the big themes and has been a big theme. Um, in the longer term, there may be, uh, you know, as the, uh, the footprint of the big techs uh, become larger and they become more entrenched and they become uh, dominant players. Uh, there is perhaps the, the question of the competitive uh, um, consequences uh, that uh, once you have a walled garden, uh, they could use their network effects, they could use um, their dominant position to exclude uh, competitors and to entrench their position, um, which may lead to uh, you know, uh, eventually higher costs um, uh, to the detriment of the users themselves. In the case of the payment system, there is a larger issue, which has, which has to do with the integrity of the monetary system itself. So if um, we feel that uh, you know, the, the walled garden um, can be uh, you know, so dominant that uh, um, it may even impinge on the role of the central bank as the issuer of the currency, uh, then uh, there may be questions about the integrity of the monetary system uh, on, on top of which um, uh, the financial system uh, you know, itself lies. So let me just discuss two examples of this in the context, uh, firstly of the payment system, and then in the context of credit intermediation. Now from um, the perspective of the payment system, uh, one very important strand uh, of the work done at central banks and uh, the, the current payment service providers and the payment infrastructure providers has been uh, to, tr to try and, um, uh, to build an open platform which will allow a transition from um, uh, a walled garden uh, to a public square, or uh, in those cases where um, the, uh, the presence of big techs is relatively small, that uh, one can um, uh, guard against uh, uh, possible uh, establishment of uh, dominant platforms through a more open uh, through a more open platform. Now, the image of the public square 
um, relies on the idea that um, we need to combine the benefits of technology and the mutually reinforcing virtuous circle of uh, data network effects and the activities loop, while at the same time uh, preserving a level competitive playing field and, uh, uh, and thereby um, uh, enriching the ecosystem of the, of the payment system itself. So in last year's economic, uh, um, so last year's, uh, in, in last year's annual economic report that we published, we, we developed uh, this theme at length using this analogy that uh, uh, instead of a walled garden, imagine that we have a public square and uh, the public square is open to uh, sellers who are both competitors, but who also bring differentiated goods to the market. And the idea here in the picture is that you have sellers of uh, cheese or fruit or vegetables. And uh, um, the, the, the more varied the, uh, the produce that's available in the market, uh, the, the greater is the benefit to the consumer. And so a consumer who comes to buy cheese, for example, may also be potential customers of fruit and vegetables. So in this respect, um, you know, there could be uh, a strategic complementarity, if you like. There could be spillover effects uh, um, uh, between sellers, which are positive. Uh, so normally we think of sellers as competing with each other. So even for differentiated goods, uh, we think of them as being um, uh, competitors and therefore uh, one firm's gain is another firm's loss. However, if the differentiated goods market generates a vibrant ecosystem, this generates this two-way uh, market, uh, which attracts more buyers, which in turn would attract more sellers. So um, when you have uh, competition across sellers, but also uh, this thick market externality going on between the sellers and the buyers, the sellers could actually end up uh, making other sellers better off as well as the buyers. And the customers would benefit twice over in that uh, firstly, there is a rich uh, selection of goods, but also um, uh, the, the additional entry of the sellers would also uh, reduce prices as well. So what, uh, what could possibly achieve that? I think, um, one of the uh, really important uh, innovations and developments in payment systems, especially retail payment systems, has been the, uh, in, the um, introduction of fast payment systems that um, allow some form of data portability and uh, through uh, APIs, the application programming interfaces, to provide a, um, uh, a competitive level playing field. Now, data portability is going to be a very important uh, part of, um, uh, pr uh, of promoting a competitive level playing field, but uh, data portability by itself may not be sufficient uh, if um, the, the format of the data uh, is going to be very cumbersome to use. So portability used as merely a data dump uh, will have very limited effect. I think this is where the, uh, the, the the standardized form um, and the technical delivery of that data may be, may be very important. This is where the, these uh, APIs uh, would be very important. One aspect of this is a so-called account information service where individual users uh, can give consent to competing payment service providers to access data. So in other words, you can open the app for bank A and check your balance in bank B. And the other important element is the so-called payment initiation service, where you can authenticate uh, payments um, using the app of one payment service provider to make payments from uh, another account uh, in, a, in another institution on the same platform. So for example, if you open your app for bank A and actually um, uh, instruct bank B uh, to make uh, a payment to a third party. So you can actually um, uh, use your, your app in this very uh, open way. And I think um, uh, this, uh, um, this particular theme has been very important and has been exemplified particularly by uh, countries 
uh, that are not held back by legacy systems and who have uh, managed to, to implement fast payment systems um, um, in uh, a very fast period, in, in a very short period of time. The uh, UPI system in India, I think, is well known. But uh, um, in, in your region, uh, you know, we, we know the example of uh, PIX in, in Brazil and CODI in Mexico. And of course, we, uh, we know many other cases uh, in other regions of the world. Now, just to pursue uh, the, the open market square analogy, what do we mean by having, a, uh, having an open market square in the retail payment space? Well, um, first of all, we can think of the central bank's settlement account literally as a public square because that is the space that the central bank makes available either directly by allowing banks and uh, in some jurisdictions also uh, non-bank payment service providers to settle on its balance sheet or possibly indirectly where the payment service provider would then go through a non-bank payment service provider would then go through a commercial bank um, with uh, access to that public square. So either directly or indirectly you would have um, the central bank settlement account uh, serving as a public square. Now, what is the analogy here with the, um, <clears throat> with the uh, differentiated good sellers? Well, the idea here, um, here is that uh, uh, whether it's uh, for banks or whether it's fintechs, uh, you know, they bring a variety of different services that are bundled with payment services. So one of the big themes, uh, in fact, I was uh, um, chairing a panel um, uh, at the um, uh, at our BI um, Innovation Summit, where uh, I hosted some um, representatives of retail payment service providers, where the big theme is the so-called embedded finance, where um, you are you are embedding financial services um, uh, in a seamless way with other uh, with other offerings, uh, you know, whether it be. Uh, uh, you know, ride hailing, or whether it be um, uh, 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 the the other various uh, bundles of these services. And in that context, once you're a member of a particular pa uh, platform, and uh, you can use the payment services, uh, um, set, uh, the the uh, the app provided by one PSP to access the other PSPs, uh, what you provide is this very rich ecosystem. Uh, which combines both the DNA loop and that virtuous circle together with uh, hopefully a level competitive playing field where, uh, not, uh, uh, where the information is shared um, in, a, uh, in a way that preserves privacy and uh, is governed by strong uh, safeguards, but nevertheless uh, gives uh, sufficient control to the individual users um, that can be used to promote uh, a, a level playing field. I think this is an important theme because <clears throat> if we look at the, the cost of retail payments, <clears throat> we still see that um, the established uh, uh, payment uh, uh, platforms um, <clears throat> uh, still exert quite a high cost. And this is a chart that uh, comes from uh, a recent BIS quarterly review piece, which shows that if we uh, look at the um, the at least the, the, the payment revenue as a percentage of GDP um, of the various payment uh, um, service providers, that uh, it can still uh, add up to quite a large proportion. And you see that um, uh, Latin America uh, uh, still represents some of the some of the highest uh, um, costs uh, uh, globally. Even um, in Europe, where you know there are uh, regulations concerning uh, credit card uh, interchange fees, for example, um, here you see a, a for for a twenty five euro payment, uh, you see the uh, the merchant service costs associated with handling uh, a fairly small payment, and you see that uh, in the purple, uh, the the um, uh, the surfacing costs. Um, uh, to do with credit cards and debit cards can still be quite sizable. So I think this is still work in progress. Uh, we have uh, many issues still to be discussed. Uh, and perhaps one thing to add on this chart on uh, the central bank settlement account as a public square, of course, it's a, it's a very small step 
from this uh, kind of system uh, where you have uh, APIs uh, that give a competitive level playing field that uh, preserve data privacy uh, that, uh, that uh, and in some cases you have a centralized register of the uh, of the users it's a very small step from this to a system that relies on some uh, on some version of a central bank digital currency so the central bank digital currency the CBdc could in turn be a one manifestation of uh, this uh, this vision of the central bank settlement accounts uh, as a public square. So let me turn to uh, the issue of credit intermediation and some of the, uh, the trade-offs that arise there. And let me um, motivate this discussion by asking you to imagine a black box like this. And uh, this black box is going to uh, guide your credit uh, um, decisions. Uh, and uh, let's imagine the following story. You uh, input the name of uh, a particular borrower, and then the black box will uh, either show a red light or it will show a green light. And the red light means do not lend, and a green light means uh, uh, go ahead and lend. Now, um, of course, um, you know, we, can, uh, we need to see how accurate this signal was relative to the eventual outturn and let's think about this in terms of the following uh, diagram. So on the horizontal axis, let's measure the proportion of the bad loan applicants who will eventually default, who nevertheless receive a green light. So this is, if you like, the incidence of mistakes uh, where you're giving too much credit. On the vertical axis, let's measure the proportion of good loan applicants that received uh, a green light. So this is the proportion um, of those decisions that uh, was actually correct. Now, um, even if the black box is completely uninformative, uh, you can imagine dialing up the, uh, the sensitivity of the red light so that uh, um, uh, the frequency of the red light um, um, uh, is decreasing as you, as you turn up the dial. So the in if you like, the, uh, the frequency of the green light is increasing as you turn up the dial. And that means that whether you're a bad loan applicant or whether you're a good loan applicant, uh, you will uh, have the same frequency of the green light coming up. So this is a, a very uninformative and noisy black box. So uh, we, we should certainly do better than this, uh, this uh, 45 degree line when, you know, as we dial up or down uh, the sensitivity of this black box. But hopefully we can do much better because um, the ideal case would be that, uh, uh, that all the good applicants would get the green light and that none of the bad applicants would get the green light. So what we're aiming for in the best possible case would be uh, this green dotted line where um, you want uh, uh, the, the red light to come on uh, uh, if and only if you have a bad loan applicant and the green light to come on if and only if uh, it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good loan applicant. But in general, we can measure the accuracy of this kind of black box by um, uh, trying to move uh, the curve in this space further to the, to the outer edge. So if we can move the curve upwards and to the left uh, in this space, we will be uh, aiming for a more accurate um, uh, black box. So this is a, a, a way of assessing how good uh, the credit assessment uh, happens to be. Now in the uh, special chapter that we published uh, two years ago, we actually managed to get some data, underlying data from uh, Mercado Libre for their, uh, for their credit assessments. And uh, this is what we find. So, if we look at the credit bureau score, so this is not using the, uh, uh, the, the granular data of the e-commerce platform and any other data analytics, just looking at the standard credit bureau scores on the borrower characteristics. So you, the, the usual kind of um, uh, income statements, balance sheet information uh, and, uh, and other credit information. This is the kind of uh, uh, yellow uh, curve that we can we can receive uh, that, that that we can achieve 
it's certainly better than the uh, 45 degree line. And so there is a great deal of value in uh, this credit assessment that comes from the credit bureau score. However, if um, we also use the Mercado Libre um, uh, algorithm and it's uh, more detailed data that comes from the, the e-commerce platform, we can actually go to the blue line, uh, which gives a, a much better uh, discrimination between uh, the good borrowers and the bad borrowers. So in this respect, uh, the greater scope for using individual data, not only the, uh, the data for the individual borrowers, but also the network information, where you can actually see um, who are the borrowers uh, that are linked with other good credits, and uh, what do the interconnections within the financial system reveal about uh, the other participants' assessment of the, uh, of the borrower's credit worthiness. Uh, so, for example, you know, if, um, if you have a fraudulent application where you have just a sign outside the door and you're taking a picture and then you uh, uh, send in your application with that picture, well, you can look at uh, how that firm has done on the e-commerce platform. If you also have payments data, which is, of course, what uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay would have uh, uh, you know, on their platforms, you can see what the interconnections are in the network. And if you see that uh, this node has a very little connections with the other nodes in the system, then at least um, this is a node that uh, deserves a second look, uh, because it's highly unlikely that you have a vibrant firm uh, that is so disconnected with the rest of the network. So whatever the reason, we do see um, a greater uh, discrimination ability. Now, in terms of the credit risk assessment, what this means is, um, in let's think of a standard uh, Vasicek uh, uh, credit risk model that's uh, the, the backbone um, uh, of, the, uh, of the Basel II, now Basel III capital accords. Um, there, the parameters have to do with uh, the probability of default, the loss given default, uh, and this crucial parameter rho, which is the correlation uh, in the default. And what we see here is that probably uh, in all likelihood, the probability of default is going to be low. And also the loss given default will also be mitigated. Um, and I think here there is still a, um, an open question as to whether the uh, mitigation of loss given default and the probability of default is due, to the, is due to the greater discrimination of the data or it's due to the implicit threat of exclusion uh, from a very large platform. So if, for example, um, uh, a large e-commerce platform were to say, well, if you default, then we will exclude you from the platform. Well, that could be a very uh, you know, important threat, especially if that platform is a very dominant player in the economy. So we don't uh, 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 yet have enough information uh, and uh, uh, the BIS staff are, actually, uh, are currently working on this issue, whether the greater discrimination is due to better information or uh, the, the greater um, implicit threat to exclusion. But certainly um, the, the data uh, reveal that uh, um, both the probability of default and the loss given default tend to be lower. We have less information on the correlation, uh, but I think uh, this is something that uh, uh, we, can, we can certainly uh, look into further. Now, how does this uh, manifest in the empirical results? We, we published a, a working paper last year uh, using some data that we were able to um, uh, obtain from, uh, from Ant Financial. And we ran these regressions where we looked at the, uh, the elasticity of credit with respect to various uh, uh, you know, macro indicators. Uh, so in particular, to house prices and to GDP. Now, if we find that uh, credit supply is highly correlated with, uh, with house prices, uh, this would probably indicate um, a much more uh, collateral driven lending model, uh, which would uh, show the usual pro-cyclicality. Now, if we look at the middle panel here, we do indeed see that uh, uh, secured bank credit um, has a very high elasticity with respect to house prices. And that's not uh, a surprise because 
um, the higher the value of the collateral, the more willing the bank would be to, to lend. But there is less um, correlation with GDP. Uh, but if we look at the unsecured bank credit, um, again, bank credit tends to be uh, um, uh, very sensitive uh, to these uh, macro indicators. However, if, if we look at the left-hand panel, we see that big tech credit is much less sensitive. And uh, amazingly, perhaps uh, the elasticity with respect to house prices is not even statistically significant. So I think this is a kind of um, uh, a sense that uh, the big techs are able to use um, additional information, other information uh, that uh, go directly to the, uh, to the cash flows and to the business models. Uh, perhaps looking at these network information, for example, that uh, allow them to break free from the use of collateral. So this is a, a, a really a very interesting area for further study. And uh, um, we're actually working on uh, a more detailed estimation of uh, these Basel III uh, credit risk parameters uh, using that data. On the other hand, um, if the big tech is very well entrenched uh, and is able to um, uh, use their market power to exercise price discrimination in a very uh, granular way, then there is also a distributional element. So uh, this uh, graph shows the usual textbook uh, example, where there's a trade-off between on the, on the left-hand side, um, in a uh, non-discriminating monopoly case, you have the markup, which reduces um, overall welfare due to the, uh, the dead weight loss. But at least uh, the consumer is able to capture the, the blue triangle. If, on the other hand, the big tech is able to price discriminate in a perfect way, uh, then uh, it's the big tech that captures the full surplus. And in addition, if we also assume that uh, the big tech is able to uh, uh, use more malleable preferences, uh, then it could even uh, shift the demand curve um, uh, in the direction that increases its, uh, uh, you know, its benefits. So I think there is a, um, a very important trade-off that has to do with competition uh, which I will, which I will turn to now. I think this is a very important uh, point that we can we can consider. So let me conclude with a few thoughts on the um, the issues in uh, in big tech regulation. I think uh, um, one way to frame uh, one way to frame the discussion is to think of this triangle, where the corners of the triangle represent um, a broadly speaking uh, public policy objectives. So on the top of the triangle, that corner uh, represents financial stability uh, and market integrity. On the right-hand uh, triangle, um, this uh, uh, represents uh, allocative efficiency and competition. So this is uh, what the uh, monopoly commission or the, um, uh, or, the, or the competition authorities would be most concerned about. But I think big techs also bring in this additional element of data privacy. And so the left uh, corner is data protection, privacy, and, uh, and related issues to do with data governance. Now, traditionally, we have uh, focused on the trade-off between um, uh, the stability and competition. And this is arrow number one. And here, the idea is that um, some people have argued for a competitive banking sector in order to lower costs. But from a financial stability perspective, many people have argued that a concentrated banking sector is more conducive to financial stability uh, because uh, of the, the additional um, uh, capital strength that comes from greater profitability and also the higher, uh, the higher franchise value that comes from the higher, uh, the higher profits uh, and the behavioral implications of that. Now, when uh, big techs are involved, we have these two other dimensions that come in. So arrow number two is this trade-off between um, how, much, um, how much data should you be using, for example, for credit assessment versus uh, restricting uh, use of data for the benefit of uh, uh, data privacy. And I think here the conversation uh, is still in its early stages because the data privacy, the, the data regulators 
uh, tend to have a much more um, a basic, uh, uh, if you like, sort of foundational view of data privacy as a basic right. Uh, whereas economists and uh, regulators tend to see uh, the privacy dimension more as a kind of instrumental goal. And, and that conversation, I think, uh, uh, you know, will, will need to happen uh, and, uh, um, uh, and is progressing. And finally, there's a third dimension of the discussion, which has to do with uh, you know, how much data can the authorities use, whether it be the central bank or whether it be uh, the, the AML CFT authorities uh, to guard against money laundering and illicit activities versus um, preserving privacy for the individual users. And of course, you know, that is also a very important element uh, of the debate. So one way that uh, this particular discussion has uh, now evolved um, is to uh, now put on the table the uh, trade-offs that arise uh, between an activities-based approach to regulation versus an entity-based uh, approach to regulation. So traditionally, um, it's uh, the, the, the big techs have uh, relied very much more on the activities-based um, uh, regulatory framework. So whether it be from the payments uh, services or whether it be credit or insurance or wealth management, uh, there are licenses that they can, uh, that, uh, they can obtain that allow them to enter these business lines. If we think about uh, banks, on the other hand, we apply an entity-based regulation for them because uh, the, the uh, soundness of banks and the uh, externalities that are generated by uh, instability from weaker banks and uh, insolvencies of banks um, uh, necessitate this additional layer that have to do with prudential requirements uh, that look at insolvencies. And the question is, which, which of these approaches is the appropriate one for the case of big techs? And let me just flag this paper from my colleague, uh, Fernando Restoy, uh, who uh, lay out some of the arguments and, uh, and some of the uh, examples of, uh, of debate. And let me just conclude by um, uh, just giving you a quick update from that paper, which is that uh, now, increasingly, we are approaching um, uh, more of an entity-based approach uh, to regulating big techs. And a more entity-based um, approach is now gaining ground in some of the major jurisdictions. So in the US, uh, you, know, you may have seen the, um, the congressional uh, uh, subcommittee. Um, uh, there was a report that was published in, in October. Perhaps the, uh, the most advanced in this field, and, uh, and we have a session on this later in the conference, um, is what the European Union has been doing in, in terms of its, uh, its two very uh, uh, landmark pieces of legislation, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Uh, the first one um, uh, on, on social media and, uh, and other conduct, and the second one uh, much more so on the, uh, on the payment system and uh, financial services. And there, there is a threshold for the number of users uh, set at 45 million, which uh, uh, in effect um, uh, really uh, aims these regulations at the big techs. So it, it's much more of an entity-based uh, approach. And I'm sure that you've also been following the events in China, uh, where um, there has uh, also been some many, um, many recent innovations in this, particular, uh, in this particular field. So let me conclude and just uh, you know, end with the question that um, uh, that is on many of our minds, which is um, what is the proper role of central banks uh, in this field? Uh, I think central banks have a role vis-a-vis -vis the payment system, uh, also as financial uh, supervisors, um, and also now increasingly uh, encountering the question of what is the appropriate market structure for the payment system, and therefore inevitably venturing in to the issue of competition and data privacy as well. So there is an issue of how do we coordinate our activities vis-a-vis -vis the competition authorities and the data protection authorities. So Seraphim, let me, uh, let me conclude there and uh, uh, I'd be very uh, keen to, uh, um, to uh, hear reactions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sheen. Uh, we have already some questions, so, but uh, if you allow me, I would like to comment something 
first taking the advantage of being the, the chair, is that uh, have you also considered uh, the environmental cost of uh, what the big techs are doing? For example, there is a very interesting paper on, which is called something around the stochastic uh, parrots, which refers to the exploitation of the um, uh, natural language uh, databases that they have at, at Google. And then, in fact, it triggered a, a, an investigation into the ethics of using these artificial intelligence techniques. So we, as regulators, my view is that we are not aware uh, of the cost that also this intense use of artificial intelligence is taking. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't take into consideration the environmental cost and either the ethical issues that might be arising because if uh, part of the algorithm of the machine learning is using some fields which are sensitive to, I don't know, gender, race or background, this can be already being used by these uh, algorithms. And uh, another uh, thing is that uh, I would like also to stress is that the, at the Innovation Hub, we are in fact using network information for detecting uh, anomalous payments using payments data. We have two excellent uh, use cases, one with our colleagues from the Bank of Colombia and El Salvador, and also with our colleagues from uh, Ecuador. So uh, just to let you know that we are working on this, we are using uh, machine learning techniques uh, also for this. So uh, this is also a comment, but I, I don't know, maybe you are also thinking on that. Yes. We have let a me just, um, yeah, let me perhaps uh, just uh, um, address your comments, I think, which are very, very good comments. And um, uh, I think your comments uh, uh, bear directly on this triangle that I showed earlier. Uh, your example of uh, the use of the, the uh, issues to do with ethics in, um, uh, in using uh, machine learning and, uh, and granular data would be this number two, uh, which have to do with the, um, the efficiency versus the data protection angle. And um, um, you know, there is also the issue of implicit biases that come in um, uh, even if you use uh, a, uh, what is ostensibly a neutral machine learning algorithm, uh, we know that uh, even uh, knowing which uh, brand of phone you use uh, uh, to access a particular service reveals a lot about uh, your income uh, and other details. Um, and so um, uh, there, there is a, a very active field um, in, uh, in financial economics at the moment which is looking at the implicit biases uh, that come in when you have, um, uh, when you have uh, machine learning. And on the, uh, AML, uh, on the AML angle, of course, this is uh, uh, arrow three, uh, which is, uh, uh, again, a very important uh, uh, you know, trade-off. And um, I think this is the reason why I think, uh, as I said during the presentation, we need to open a dialogue uh, with the data privacy regulators. Because uh, I think uh, there is still an issue um, where the approaches are quite different. Uh, um, uh, that, that you, there is an element of a basic right uh, that is non-negotiable uh, and uh, that is incomparable uh, relative to the economic benefits. And I think here we need to, um, to, uh, to open up a, a, a conversation uh, where um, the two sides can actually uh, uh, engage in some meaningful discussions. Thank you, Sarah Finn. No, thank you, Professor. Now we have two panelists who, who would like to intervene. Uh, the first one is uh, Martin Tobal. He already let me know about he has a question. So Martin, you are able to use your microphone. Just unmute yourself. And afterwards, we'll have Jose Manuel Marquez, please. Thank you, Serafin. Thank you, Semla, for uh, the kind invitation and the great conference. Uh, and thank you, Shin, for your very insightful and pedagogical presentation. Uh, let me ask you two questions. First one is a bit of a clarification question. So in the slide where you had the comparison between um, the good and the bad borrowers, so you compare the uh, Mercado Libre credit score with a, with a more standard credit score. Then my question is, maybe I missed this, but are you comparing the same sample of borrowers? Uh, that's the that's first question, and that concerns whether there is or not a sample selection there. And related to, the point, uh, to this point, the second question, 
has to do with distributional concerns. So you, you, you talk about uh, competition, you talk about efficiency, uh, but when it comes to credit intermediation and particularly in emerging market economies, uh, so my question is whether we should also take in consideration that a uh, proportion of the population may not have access to these technologies and whether that can actually uh, make it deeper a problem of access to credit. Thank you very much. And again, thank you very much for a very nice and pedagogical presentation. Dr. Fischer, shall I answer? Uh, or, yes. or would you like to gather comments? I, yes. Maybe I can just... Uh, have, yeah, yeah. So uh, the answer to your first question, of course, um, is um, is yes. The way that we did this, and uh, uh, you can read about uh, uh, the details um, both in the annual report uh, chapter, but also we we published um, uh, this particular study uh, in economic policy, um, and uh, uh, we we give some more details. What we did was uh, um, was to firstly look at just the um, uh, so it's the same borrowers. Uh, and compare the information that comes from a, um, a purely a restricted uh, information set from the standard uh, um, indicators for credit worthiness, uh, and then looked at the and then looked at the additional information that comes from the uh, from the e-commerce platform. Uh, and in fact, we actually have some some pretty interesting um, additional findings, which I think you will find interesting in that uh, in that research paper. And on your second point, I fully agree. I think the uh, the availability of these techniques, uh, uh, I think, will be very important. Um, one of the benefits of the uh, the great availability of uh, of mobile phones um, has been that there's been this great uh, democratization, if you like, of um, uh, of financial services, and I think that's been a very uh, a promising development. Thank you, thank you. Now, now we will uh, pass the microphone to Jose Manuel, please. Uh, thanks, Serafin. Thanks, Professor Sim, for this uh, wonderful and, and very uh, motivate, mo motivational uh, presentation. I, I, I completely share with you the, the reflection on the data privacy discussion. In fact, we in Spain are uh, currently uh, working with the samples and, and the most difficult discussions is with the data protection agency. Because the, their approach to innovation is completely different and, and to the benefits. But uh, let, let me go to two questions regarding your presentation. The first one is related with the CBDC. Uh, you mentioned that uh, CBDC could be a good uh, way in some sense to, to, to introduce or to promote this competition. Uh, I wonder if the if some of the, what, what will be the role of CBDC and, and this is part of the discussion that we had yesterday on providing new service, more innovative services. I'm thinking, for example, in the programmability of money or in managing the, the privacy with um, identity, uh, digital identity approaches. I don't know if, if the, the CBDC should be only the main framework and let other providers like uh, big techs or, or other kind of technological providers to develop uh, this kind of uh, functionalities or the CBDC should enter in providing this kind of, of um, uh, functionalities. And the second question is regarding the AM and ML um, uh, techniques in order to provide credit. We, we at Bank of Spain are working on this area. We have a slightly different approach than the, the one that you mentioned. Basically, uh, we differentiate, uh, uh, as, you, as you put put on the table, that there are two effects here. One is that you can take into account more data, and the other one is that the models could be better in order to segment the, the population. We work on, on this particular area and take the, uh, some information from one big bank uh, for all the information that they have with, uh, with their customers. And, and basically, we, we use traditional uh, models like logic model and also uh, ANML ML, uh, techniques. The result is that, that with some of these techniques, we, we have a, a significant improvement and, and we translate it to to capital requirements and the savings is close to, close to 20% of, uh, of savings. Then uh, it's clear that it's important as you mentioned, the, the, next, the next step is, okay, then what should be the, the risk that we should take into account? And we go to the, to the internal internal uh, risk models of the, of the Basel approach and review what should be the requirement. And here is, is my question. When we review which things should be taken into account, uh, some of them are related with solvency issues, and in this sense, is, is we require only to finance institutions, but some of them, like the 
possible bias or the or the need to have more explainability in, in the model in order to explain a customer why he has access or do not have access to the credit should be required both to financial institutions or to uh, big techs. But uh, big techs are, are not are not uh, covered by the by the basic three requirements. Then my question is okay, how we should think about this kind of risk? Should we differentiate between prudential requirements and other kind of requirements? What is your think about that? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jose Manuel. I, those are those are really uh, two um, very substantial questions. Uh, let me see. Um, Serafin, I've I've lost the screen. Can you see me? Yes, we can see okay. you. Okay, so okay good, good. Do you want to share your screen again, or? Yes, let me let me share my screen just to uh, address um, Jose Manuel's uh, questions, which are very good uh, questions, and. Uh, uh, you had two. You had two questions. The first one is, what is the role of CBDCs um, in uh, providing a competitive level playing field? Um, I think this is still work in progress. Uh, I, I don't think we can we can say definitively what that role would be. But let me um, uh, at the same time also point out that the um, the fast payment systems that are out there uh, come in many different forms uh, with, uh, with different ways of organizing uh, these APIs uh, and in particular, the user registries. And the way that uh, um, uh, you, know, you would consult the, uh, the user registry and uh, to create the credential for a particular transaction, you know, that all has to work through public key cryptography in order to preserve the, the privacy of that particular transaction. And those kind of techniques are uh, very similar to the types of techniques that are being uh, discussed in the context of CBDC. So um, the distance between uh, these fast payment systems and the various flavors that they come in and the different varieties of CBDCs are actually not that far apart. So um, we think, you know, we can think of this more as a continuum uh, along which we have the fast payment systems uh, with uh, the APIs, with a centralized uh, registry of, um, uh, of the users of the network uh, that needs to be protected. Uh, the data needs to be governed in a very robust way um, uh, and where we can also preserve uh, the competition between the PSPs on that system. And various versions of CBDCs um, that also have uh, similar features. And I think it's worth saying that uh, within the range of possible CBDC designs, uh, there is a really a vast range, um, all the way going from uh, the naive design, if you like, where the central bank grants uh, accounts to everyone in the economy, which is a very kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, very um, uh, unrealistic uh, sort of way of running, uh, like, you know, uh, um, the central bank is not going to be able to field questions from retail users who say, you know, why didn't the payment to my landlord go through? Please check my payment, please. Uh, the central bank is not the place to, to field those kind of questions. So there, there has to be a, a partnership with the private sector. And there are many, many ways of uh, achieving, uh, you know, that, uh, that partnership. And uh, uh, if we look at some designs of CBDCs, and compare them with some designs of the fast payment systems, there are actually many, many similarities. Uh, and uh, it's a very small step from a fast payment system, which preserves these competitive uh, level playing field aspects towards one of the CBC, uh, towards one of the CBDC designs. Um, on your second question about uh, um, how we should think about big tech regulation, and in particular, uh, whether big tech should be subject to the Basel III uh, capital requirements. I think this is uh, uh, an issue, as you know, that has uh, been very actively discussed in China. And uh, some, of the, uh, some, some of the recent uh, decisions have certainly moved um, towards the direction of um, shifting the lending activities much more to a financial holding company which would then be subject to the, uh, the standard Basel uh, banking um, uh, capital requirements. And um, uh, 
Of course, China is a, is a rather special case because it's uh, further along in the journey and uh, it has um, uh, some very large companies that have uh, really established a very strong presence. Um, but I think some of, the, um, uh, some of the reasoning behind the European Union's thinking, especially for the Digital Markets Act, uh, you know, reflect some of these, uh, uh, these same considerations. And um, um, uh, uh, the, I'm looking forward to the session later on, uh, you know, on, this, on this particular question. So I hope uh, that's answered your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Matthias Osandon Bush. Uh, he's uh, recently joined Sembla. He's a researcher on many topics of financial stability. And he has a question, so I'm going to pass the microphone to Matthias. Please, Matthias. Oh, hi, Serafim. Thank you, Hinson, for the presentation. Very interesting. So I, I actually wrote my question in the QA, um, uh, Q &A chat. Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering whether the, the impact of, of uh, digital credit scores on credit risk that you were discussing um, um, can kind of have some, uh, uh, or can be related to, to what we know so far about the, the effect of relationship lending on financial stability. So we have heard over the last years, there's a lot of evidence on this, that relationship lending can benefit, for example, small firms, small borrowers with weak credit scores that they can kind of compensate for, uh, for having these weak credit scores by uh, providing or generating some soft information in their relationship with their banks or financial intermediaries. And, and I was wondering whether uh, this, the, the, the more intensive use of digital credit scores can lead to, to a kind of loss of this soft information that has proven to be relevant for for financial stability, especially in crisis times. I, I'm not an advocate necessarily of relationship lending, and we know that it ha can also have a downside risk. For example, it can maybe, I don't know, generate uh, some, some, some sort of uh, frictions by, by rent extractions, right? But, but I think it's still worth to ask whether this uh, shift to different forms of collecting and processing information can, can lead us to, to lose something of what we know so far, and that seems to matter for financial stability. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Matthias, for that question, which is a, which is a very good one. And uh, relationship lending uh, is clearly a very important theme in financial economics. Um, and uh, um, this is one of the, um, uh, this is one of the uh, very uh, you know, important topics that, uh, that have come up um, uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, these machine learning uh, you know, type of algorithms. Uh, one way to perhaps think about it, though, is that uh, some of the um, more granular information, and in particular the network type of information uh, that a payment service provider would have, would would uh, would allow to to have, would be, you know, would be um, similar in some respects to the soft information. So one example um, that uh, that we discuss in in the chapter last year, in in, in the chapter two years ago. Um, is the idea that uh, uh, by having access to the network information, uh, you can gain a sense of uh, uh, the, uh, the vibrancy of the business model, the feasibility of the business model, and, uh, the, uh, and if you know the identities of the counterparties, also to be able to uh, leverage on, on the um, assessments of the counterparties uh, in the revealed preference of uh, doing business with this particular firm. Uh, now, clearly that's not going to capture everything, um, but just in the same way that uh, uh, machine learning algorithms can uh, recognize cats from, from dogs um, and recognize mountains from, from uh, rivers and so on. This is a kind of, uh, you know, this may be a way to, uh, to see um, uh, um, to actually use some of the machine learning algorithms to, to get at that kind of soft information. But we know that, uh, uh, and as I said in one of my earlier answers, that uh, machine learning algorithms can also be subject to uh, biases and have implicit biases that, um, that creep in, even though uh, ostensibly these are, these are neutral methods. So I think, um, uh, I would say the jury is still out. Uh, but uh, uh, looking at some of the uh, some of the ways that uh, these uh, these algorithms can be used uh, would be one way to um, 
uh, you know, get at some of these questions. And of course, there are also these, the, um, the applications in SupTech uh, and RecTech, and SupTech in particular um, uh, seems to have yielded some, uh, some very promising results uh, in terms of uh, flagging for, for review, um, the uh, various cases of suspicious transactions, uh, and other ways that can uh, that can help the uh, the supervisors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Now we have Fabio and Derek Sandoval, but I'm afraid that he has had some connection problems. So I, I will read his uh, question from the Q and A chat. So he's asking about the the models, and he he noticed that you applied logistic regression. And uh, he asked if there is any specific regu regulation that you are aware of for the type of machine learning model to use, since some can be used with anomalous calibrations that somehow related to what we were talking at the beginning, that we don't know in fact what these uh, algorithms, how they are uh, calibrated in the fine tuning in order to maybe possibly lead to discrimination or undesirable outcomes. Would you like to elaborate on that, please? Yes, yes. Um, uh, um, uh, Fabio, um, uh, we were not uh, focusing on the logistic regressions as such. Maybe the shape of the curve gave you that impression, but uh, you know, that was simply the, uh, the area under the curve analysis. Uh, you know, there, there could be different ways of modeling the machine learning, or indeed it could be uh, something more sophisticated um, uh, than simply the standard uh, uh, logistic-based uh, uh, um, uh, machine learning models. Um, but I think your, your second point, I think, is, uh, is a very good one, which is, um, are there any safeguards that one can put in to, um, to uh, head off these implicit biases or other mistakes that can creep in? I think this is a very active field. Um, uh, uh, there is, a, I think, a very keen recognition of the fact that even, um, you know, even uh, uh, so-called neutral machine learning models that do not have, uh, uh, you know, race or gender or income uh, certainly into, you know, you know, as inputs, may nevertheless, uh, um, may nevertheless find proxies within the information set that correlates strongly with that. Or indeed, it could be some other association other than correlation. Um, and uh, um, I think this is where the, the consumer regulation or consumer protection side uh, could be a very important approach. And uh, I know that this is a very active uh, field of discussion. Um, and uh, many of uh, our US academic colleagues have been, have been writing on this, uh, such as uh, Thomas Philippon, and Antoinette Shaw and so on. Um, so I would recommend that you, uh, you look at some of their papers. Yeah, uh, before passing to the next question, just uh, again to briefly talk about what we are doing with the hub, is that we are bringing also this type of expertise into the region. That's something I am very big fan of doing it. We have organized a course on machine learning last year with the help of the Deutsche Bundesbank. It was an excellent course, very well attended. And this year we are going to have another version of this same course. I am convinced that we people at central banks, we really need to know indeed these algorithms. Also, we have two courses on distributed ledger technology, one the last year, and one is going to take place again this year uh, with the consulting of uh, the help from UCL, also which has a very large group on the blockchain technology. So this is, I mean, I am big fan of these techniques and I am also, I have, I have to confess a dark IT past. So I used to earn my salary uh, doing coding. So uh, this is a, a, an uncomfortable confession, but I am proud also of my time as a programmer. So the next question is by Carola Mueller, who also is a, a recent, recently joined Semla. She also does, uh, research on financial stability, but she is also, uh, we are working with her on a, uh, on a research uh, proposal, and a, a research work on interchange models, which I think is some, something very important to be, as you show in your plots, uh, the kind of uh, 
costs associated with the use of cards. And so it's, it's, it's a topic that we consider very important for us in the region. So Carola, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Serafin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shin, for this very interesting talk. As Serafin mentioned, we are working on, on a project where we consider the entry of payment aggregators in the payment market. And with that, we learned that, well, of course, there are big techs like Mercado Libre and like Mercado Pago, but also there are a lot of, in many countries, there are a lot of small, innovative fintech firms that try to, to enter and penetrate the market. So. I'm thinking about the, the, I think that the regulation has a very important role in, in enabling this entry and this innovative process within a market, for example, the payment market. So, and also you mentioned this, this, this um, discussion about entity-based regulation versus activity-based regulation. And of course, maybe for small firms an entity-based regulation is, is more difficult to achieve. And then we also see a discussion about the acquisition strategies of big techs that, that sort of uh, have a very aggressive approach to, to incorporating competitors, small competitors that could have the potential to innovate and to disrupt the market later on. So I would like to hear um, how should regulators balance between these big techs and small innovative firms that, that have maybe a lot of potential but also need a lot of um, yeah, space and a lot of uh, maybe uh, protection, so to say, to, to grow in this environment. And what is your stance of, in general of the role of regulation for small innovative fintech firms? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carola, for that question. I think it's a really important one. Um, in the, uh, in the payment space, um, uh, perhaps one of the most important uh, uh, roles in competition can actually be played by the central bank um, and um, the associated infrastructures uh, that, that underlie um, the retail payment uh, system. Um, as you say, if you um, have small fintechs that uh, would like to enter the payment system, um, then you know they would need to be uh, a member of the fast payment system platform. And I think one of the benefits of having uh, a uh, a public square model of the payment system in a fast payment system is that you can um, you can allow the entry of new new participants who, who can bring a differentiated uh, product to the market uh, and thereby turning the, uh, the data network activities loop into a virtuous loop. And that's gonna be very much more difficult if you already have a dominant um, uh, provider that has a closed network um, and, uh, uh, and that would be much more difficult to penetrate. Um, what this means, uh, however, is that there are some very thorny policy questions for the central bank. So one um, a very a big issue that has been much discussed is whether the central bank uh, settlement accounts should be available to, uh, to non-bank uh, payment service providers. And uh, uh, central banks have taken a different route in this, um, in this case. Uh, in the case of the Bank of England, uh, they have allowed um, uh, fintechs, the non-bank payment service providers access to the Bank of England uh, settlement accounts, albeit um, only during the day uh, rather than overnight. Uh, there the issue is, um, is there an implicit commitment that uh, there will be liquidity support for these uh, payment services providers, even though they're, they're not a bank? And I think that's a very difficult policy question. Other jurisdictions um, like Switzerland here um, and, in the, uh, and in the euro area, uh, there is also a, um, uh, a great deal of openness towards competition, uh, but still uh, the payment system is very much um, via the commercial banking sector. And, and that's a different model. Uh, that's a more indirect model where you allow the, uh, the PSP access to the payment system, but via the commercial banks. Uh, but it's nevertheless um, uh, keeping into the spirit of the, um, uh, you know, of that competitive, uh, um, of that competitive level playing field. Uh, the um, 
On the regulation, um, what this means is that uh, uh, inevitably there may be a difference between a big tech that is very large uh, and a very large user base um, whose data becomes a very valuable uh, resource in which to make an entry into financial services um, from the small fintechs that are just starting out and with a very small market share and whose main advantage uh, you know, is the technology. So I think striking that balance would, uh, um, and so the way that the European Union has gone is to just have this uh, threshold of uh, 45 million users uh, as the threshold um, above which you would apply these new, uh, you know, these new entity-based rules. Uh, but that's a very, you know, that's a very a blunt uh, uh, instrument. But it would be, uh, you know, one way of keeping the small fintechs out of the regulatory loop. Thank you, thank you so much. Now I will uh, pass the microphone to uh, uh, Raúl Morales, who sent this. He is uh, one of the founding members of this forum, one of the architects, also works on the interchange models uh, project with uh, Carola. Uh, he's been a Sembla member of staff for a while, so he's one of our assets on these topics here. So Raul, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Rafin, and thank you, Professor Shin, for a nice presentation, a very interesting discussion. Uh, my question is basically twofold. Uh, First, uh, do you see any, speaking of international cooperation, do you see any, any space for BIS committees to, to work in a, in, in a kind of a set of standards similar to Basel III, for instance, uh, leveraging the principles of financial market infrastructure to be applied for, for big techs or stable coins arrangements, uh, for instance? Uh, and, and, and the second question has to do with the, 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 the issue of uh, a kind of regulatory mismatch in the sense that for emerging economies, uh, it, it, it could be uh, uh, very likely that big techs or, or stable coins could, could uh, be already uh, taking a major role, but without uh, a proper regulatory and, and supervisory arrangement. In that respect, what would be your 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 view in terms of uh, an institutional setup where regulation and financial supervision are kind of separated, meaning that you have a central bank isolated from financial supervision? What are you seeing in, in this respect worldwide? Thank you. Thank you, Raul, for that uh, um, very interesting pair of questions. Uh, your first question was about uh, international cooperation, and I think um, uh, the BIS uh, is indeed um, uh, uh, facilitating um, cooperation on many fronts. Uh, first of all, there is the, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the CPMI. Uh, that's probably the, um, uh, the most uh, prominent uh, in a forum where these uh, payments and market infrastructure discussions uh, you know, uh, uh, take place. Um, the, you mentioned the PFMIs, uh, and I, I think this is the uh, you know this is the uh, the forum where I think we can we can certainly have the most uh, um, uh, useful uh, most useful discussions and the standard setting. Um, the particular uh, application to cross border payments uh, is actually a very important topic this year in the G20. Uh, it began with the Saudi presidency last year. Um, when um, the CPMI uh, uh, was involved uh, very, uh, you know, very much with the FSB, who actually you know, coordinated this effort um, on uh, the so-called 19 building blocks of uh, uh, of the roadmap uh, of the uh, uh, of the cross-border payments initiative, and uh, that includes um, issues such as uh, data governance, uh, digital ID governance. Um, issues to do with uh, uh, improving existing infrastructures, but also um, looking at the blue skies projects that uh, think about new technologies and how they may improve uh, cross-border payments. And that includes uh, CBDCs. Uh, you may have seen this uh, paper that we published 
on multiple CBDC arrangements this week. Um, but, uh, um, but also um, uh, uh, non-CBDC infrastructures, uh, multilateral infrastructures that can actually overcome some of the, uh, some of the frictions. So, the, so CPMI is a very, very important forum, but um, let me also mention the, the very important work that is, that is done in, uh, in your region uh, by the BIS uh, uh, consultative group on, the, uh, on innovation and digital economy. So this is um, a, uh, an initiative of the uh, central banks uh, in the CCA, the consultative uh, group, um, the, the, uh, the consultative council for the, for the Americas. And it's chaired by uh, uh, Miguel Diaz uh, at the Bank of Mexico. And it's been doing some very, very important work, uh, much more practical work, for example, on the issue of API that I mentioned and uh, how to uh, have practical impact on, uh, on, improvement, uh, on improvement of the infrastructure. So I think that's uh, been a very important forum uh, for regional cooperation uh, separately from the CPMI discussion. And finally, let me also mention that uh, the, the Innovation Hub um, has set up a, quite an extensive regional and uh, consultative um, networks uh, around the world and uh, it's uh, you know because the BIS, uh, you know, unlike the IMF, is not um, uh, is not omnipresent. It's it's not a universal membership uh, uh, organization. But nevertheless, we have a pretty extensive membership. We now have sixty three members, member central banks around the world. And what we have tried to do with uh, with the with the innovation hub uh, network is to bring in all of our member central banks uh, into the discussion. And we have organized the discussion uh, according to the various um, uh, initiatives. We have six big initiatives uh, in the Innovation Hub. You can read about it in our webpage. And we have organized uh, consultative groups uh, for each of those big themes. So uh, absolutely, I think the, uh, the international cooperation angle is going to be a really important theme. Uh, now, on your, on your second question about how, you know, what is the appropriate role? So your question was, uh, how do we distinguish the central bank's role uh, in, its operational, um, uh, uh, in its operational capacity from the more supervisory role? And I think this is um, uh, an area where, um, you know, we need to recognize that not all central banks are financial supervisors. In some jurisdictions, the supervision is, is, is in a separate institution. And the institutional you know, underpinnings of the, super, uh, the, the supervision is going to be playing a very important role. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier that the discussion between uh, central banks and uh, financial supervisors on the one hand that want to use the information uh, versus the data privacy regulators who regard the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the privacy protection of individual data as uh, akin to something more like an individual basic right, uh, that that kind of discussion also needs to be, you know, needs to be engaged as well. So uh, um, if we look around, I think there is no one model, but uh, um, if you look at some of the jurisdictions where these issues have really come to the fore, and I would point to China as being a very, being a very important example. Um, uh, I think we can see the outlines of some of the potential uh, debates that uh, will be, um, I think, more widespread uh, in, the, in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, I'm a, there is one last question. Uh, I promise that we will not abuse uh, again because uh, everybody's willing to, to talk with you. So I, I'm going to ask Carlos to be really brief because we have already reached the limit of the session. Carlos León from the Banco Central de la República, please. Uh, hi, Serafín, uh, Professor Shin. It's a, a real pleasure to be able to make these two questions to you. I'll try to be brief. The first one has to do with something that you answered like uh, two questions before, and it has to do with uh, where should financial and payment regulation be in like in the in the in the regulatory framework of countries. Uh, what I mean is, do you think that they should be, this financial and the payment regulation, be together under the same umbrella, under the same institution to achieve uh, uh, like, like a coordinated or articulated regulation of the payment ecosystem that gathers financial and non-financial payment 
service providers. That's the first one. The second one will be a little bit easier. Uh, how could we compare the informational content content that fintechs have of the people they are they are using those those platforms in the sense that fintechs are really intrusive uh, regarding the data of their clients. Uh, what I mean is that last week I had a, 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 like an informal talk with the chief technology officer of, of a major uh, fintech here in Colombia, and I was amused of the things that they are using from the mobile phones of the people to make these credit uh, scores that you show us that you compared with, let's call it like traditional credit scoring agencies. How can we compare those? Because it, it's it, those fintechs are really intrusive and people, they really don't know what they are uh, giving away the information when they, they install an application in their mobile. It's very, it, it raises uh, ethical uh, questions about how, how to compare those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, for those two very important questions, Carlos. I think uh, the first one is a very difficult one, uh, but let me uh, answer it in two parts. Um, when it comes to the payment system, um, the central bank is the uh, is the issuer of uh, of high powered money, and eventually um, the final. Uh, the, the ultimate settlement of a payment uh, will happen on the central bank uh, settlement accounts. And uh, in that respect, um, I think it's quite right that the central bank uh, has um, uh, perhaps full control, but also uh, you know, if there are other interested regulators there, that it has a very substantial say uh, in how the payment system uh, is, um, is regulated and how integrity is, is maintained. Um, the, uh, the issue of uh, supervision, I think, is, of course, much more difficult. And this is a debate that has gone, uh, that goes back uh, decades now. When central, bank, uh, when, the, when central banks gained independence in monetary policy and uh, went in for inflation targeting and, uh, and went in for much more of a sort of technical, if you like, a, 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 a technically driven uh, uh, mandate, but that was when uh, many of the splits uh, you know, happened between monetary policy and financial supervision. Now, uh, I think we can go back and look at the, the rationale for, for doing that uh, back in those days. Uh, I think it's a good time for us to do that. Uh, uh, I think some of the arguments are probably less relevant right now, uh, but, uh, but I think the, um, uh, any, any uh, drastic changes to the institutional arrangements, I think we'll need uh, much more careful thought. Um, but I think it's worth definitely go, uh, uh, going back to the, uh, to the various arguments that were used in the uh, 1990s uh, that led to the independence uh, and the separation of supervision uh, and monetary policy in some jurisdictions. On your second question about uh, consumer protection and how uh, fintechs use data, I think this harks back to some of the, uh, the earlier questions uh, that, um, uh, uh, that I addressed. Uh, and this is the point that um, uh, you can, uh, even in the presence of various uh, safeguards on uh, the do's and don'ts of how you can use machine learning algorithms, uh, you can still nevertheless retrieve uh, many of the categories that you were forbidden from using. And, uh, um, uh, and this is uh, the literature that I uh, referred to earlier by uh, Thomas Philippon and, uh, and by Antoine Shaw. If you read the, you know, those kind of papers, um, you see that uh, there is really uh, um, nothing that's really you know, uh, entirely neutral. Uh, you can use the, uh, even the fact that you're using um, a, an Android phone rather than uh, an Apple phone. Uh, you can already learn a lot more about this person uh, than, uh, uh, than even the, uh, the, the conventional metrics would have given you. Uh, and indeed the time of day. So if you're, uh, conducting, trans uh, if you're conducting transactions at three o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, that tells you something about this person that, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that wouldn't be true for someone who, who uh, you know, has a big gap in the, in the middle of the night. Uh, so I think, on this case, it, it's a very difficult uh, issue of consumer protection. Uh, I think this is where um, uh, we, 
you know, we as central bankers uh, and as policymakers more generally, we have to work uh, together with the data privacy regulators and consumer protection regulators uh, and try to see, uh, you know, what kinds of instrumental reasoning can be applied. What are the more basic uh, human, you know, the, the more basic human rights kind of, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, non-negotiable elements that, uh, that, that need to be preserved. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that uh, we have abused a little bit of your time. You're very generous and we are extremely pleased of uh, having had you as the keynote speaker of, the, of this forum. I think that all the audience benefited a lot. Uh, I learned a lot and thank you so much again for your kind participation. And- uh, Thank you, Serafin. On the contrary, so. Um, are you are on mute, Manuel. Yes, thank you very much, Yun. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Manuel.